All right, so how's everybody doing tonight? You good? You good? You very good? Okay, so everyone's got, did everyone do the prescribed thing before class? Are you doing it right now? Okay, Wes, when you're done, will you give her that paper? So what we're going to do is we're going to write down anything you're warfaring with right now, you're struggling with, any mountains before you write it on a piece of paper. And at the end of class, we're going to do a little prophetic exercise. And we're going to get, so if you don't know, we're working on a little bit of a series on spiritual warfare. Does everyone remember what we spoke on last week? Warfare. I should hope so, if we're continuing on the series. So, what was our lead scripture? James 4, 7. Submit yourselves unto the Lord, resist the devil, and he will flee. So, what's our approach to warfare? Submission. And what's our approach to spiritual warfare? Resistance. Okay? And the devil must what? Flee. All right. Resistance, again, just a brief recap. Anytime you work with weights, resistance training, it's hard at first to push it away, to push it away. But through exercise, constant use, it becomes easier and easier. The resistance is in our mind that we push away. Hey, y'all. We push away the thoughts of Satan. We push away the things of darkness. We push them away so that we can have perfect, perfect warfare. So we're, we want everyone on this side because we're a family. And we're going to snuggle together and keep warm. I'm kidding. Please don't snuggle. Yeah. No. <laughs> Yeah, married couples, you may snuggle. Everyone else, please don't. Okay, who, did everyone uh, do the assignment from the text today? If not, just um, lift your hand up and she'll give you a notepad to write down. Okay, so the, the assignment was, I need, probably need to put you on that list too, sorry. I just normally text him. So the assignment is, write down everything you're warfaring with right now. Okay. So any mountain in front of you, any warfare object, write it down on a piece of paper. And then afterwards, we're going to do a prophetic exorcistic power back from the enemy. So recap, submit yourselves unto God. Resist the devil and he will what? Flee. Resist is like weight training. The more you practice it, the easier it becomes because it's resistance. So the force that it comes down with is the force that you push up with. And you push away, and the devil flees. See, the devil's not confrontational. If you resist him, he's not going to stay around. He's, he is a defeated foe because God chopped off his feet. He is disarmed, so he's got no arms. He's just a worm on his belly, and he can only intimidate you. But he can only intimidate you with facts you perceive as truth. But the moment you go to the Psalms 91 and you say his truth, is my shield and buckler, meaning my shield, long shield, and my short shield. It means he's got no, he cannot penetrate your defenses if you know what the truth is. And what's the Hebrew word for truth? It's emet. This is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. This is the middle letter. And this is the last letter. And the saying is, if it's a truth in the beginning, if it's the same truth in the middle, and it's the same truth to the end, we consider it God's truth because it's never changing. It's always the same. It varies not. I am the Lord God. I change not. His truth is never changing. His thoughts for you from the foundation of the world. That's why we know Christ was crucified where? At the foundation, before the foundations of the world. Christ was crucified. So... In order for us to know what truth we believe, we have to know the validity of it throughout our lives, through the beginning of your life, your, your newborn life, through the hardships, right until the end. That truth must never waver from your mindset. Okay? So submitting yourselves unto the Lord, unto God, resist the devil, and he will what? Flee from you? Okay, I did start this. 
Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so we resist him. We push back. We push against. We assault against the thoughts. And we, what do we do? We cast down every thought and vain imagination that exalts itself above the Lord. You see, warfare is about really rest. And rest starts in submission. What am I submitted to? Am I submitted to facts or am I submitted to faith? Do I live by what I see or do I live by faith? Because the word says we live by faith, not by sight. So sight always tells you physical facts in front of you. Faith tells you you call those things that don't seem like they're there as though they are there. So I don't live by my emotions. I don't live... now. Do we get it right all the time? I'm the first to admit no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with Paul on this one. I speak not that I've obtained, but that I'm pressing towards the mark. You know, I, I'm the first one to tell you, when warfare comes, my mind goes 180 miles this way, 180 miles that way, you know. And then after I've run a marathon in my head and I'm emotionally exhausted, I come back to the simplicity of the word and I'm like, aha! Eureka! Why didn't I start there? <laughs> Santa Maria! No, no, don't pray to her. Just, you know, it's, it's a saying. Why didn't I start there? Why couldn't I just begin at that point? But, you know, as, we, as I get a little bit older, most of you are older than me, but as I get wiser in, in my levels as I get leveled up, I'm trying to be nice about age, yeah, so... But as I get older and I get wiser, I find myself starting more at that point. Not all the times, but I've, with my walk with the Lord, I, I just learned to, especially going through immigration's process, because I, I knew that Satan was going to fight me. I had this spiritual encounter and he told me. The enemy came face to face with me and said, I'm going to deport you. And I had visions and I saw other people had visions too and they told me and I'm like oh I'm not in the mood for a fight but I sat back and I'm going to admit I was anxious throughout the process but I sat back and I said God only you can fight this I've got nothing in fact the circumstance if I was an agent and I looked at this situation I think someone's trying to pull the wool over my eyes so I'm just going to sit back and trust you because that's all I really can do. I cannot change someone else's mind. I cannot convince them. I'm not a great lawyer. So I can hire a lawyer, but that's just going to look even more suspicious. So, and actually he told me not to. He said, trust me. We had lawyers working on the case, but at the representation, at the interview, he told me not to have one. And so we didn't. And I sat there, and exactly like I saw in my vision, I saw that it would be a lady first, and I saw there would be a guy come afterwards. So I thought it was all going to happen that day. I was, I was convinced that that day I was going to happen, because they tell you, you get the results at the interview. And we went through it, and she's like, well, there's some things that are not adding up yet, but I don't have the power to make this. I'm going to give it to my supervisor, but I'm going home. And the lady took her papers, and about a week later I got my uh, the approval notice but you know it, it was war my mind was going back and forth my mind back and forth we were told that day and now I don't have the answer now oh god did I miss it and the supervisor did sign it off and he was a guy and you know just like everything happened in the visions as God told me but the warfare was to believe his word you know and I think of Paul when the storm of Rockledon came in Acts he said, men, be of good cheer. I mean, this storm, it's like those ones that, you know, we get, yeah, Betty and Homer and whatever. The, every storm, if it's a good storm, it gets a name. And this one had a name. The storm was called the Rockledon. I think it's Acts 27, around about there. Not too sure. Any Bible scholars in here? But anyways, the angel comes to Paul, and the angel says, Paul, fear not, for the Lord has heard you, and you must appear to Nero. Um, so don't worry, God has given you and all these on the ship. So Paul stands up and he says this. He says, men, be of good cheer. Fear not, for an angel of the Lord stood by me this night. And I believe that it shall be, even as it was told me this night. You see, sometimes you're not going to get an angel to stand by you and tell you the storm's not going to kill you. 
But the angel also didn't tell them that it was going to shipwreck him. So they did get to the island, but they got there on a piece of wood, not on a ship. You know? <laughs> Swiss family Robertson. Then, if that's now, they, now they're trying to dry and they're taking all, throwing some logs on a fire, and an old venomous, the King James says, a venomous beast fastened on his hand. And in all these things, Paul's not moved because he's got a word. You see, the warfare wasn't the snake, it wasn't the shipwreck, it was believing what God said. You see, Paul wasn't moved by the shipwreck nor by the snake. He just shook it off because he had the word. So was the warfare the snake? Was the warfare the ship? Or was the warfare believing what God said? See, you've got a far greater word of prophecy. By his stripes, you are already healed. So is the warfare the sickness or believing the word? That's a deep philosophical moment where you should all go, hmm, and reflect. <laughs> reflect. Meditate. Oh, mm, no, don't do it. I kid. But if you wanted to, I will, would be funny to watch. Okay. The warfare is also knowing not what God's Word says about you, but what God's nature says towards you. Now, I want to show you something. Go to Matthew 16. And again, remember, it's not the dude standing here has not obtained this, but it's revealed to me, just like my job is to reveal it to you, but it's together as a people we walk this out. So what I'm telling you here tonight is not something that we all are living. It's something that we need to live together. You know, when Peter was strengthened, God said to him, now go strengthen the brethren. You know, when you are strengthened, strengthen. So when, when I get something in the Word, and it strengthens me in my inner core, I give it to you so it can strengthen you. And then together we'll walk it. So, we're here not to listen to my revelation. We're here to walk this thing together. My revelation is just to strengthen you. The Word is to strengthen us all. But the responsibility to be doers of the word is something we do together as a unit, as a church, as the ecclesia. So where did I say go? Matthew 16, okay. And verse 19. Well, let's start at um, verse 13. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say the Son of Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some say Elias. Others say Jeremiah's or one of the prophets. And he said, But whom do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And unto thee thou art Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give to thee the keys of the kingdom. And whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. So let's break it down. He said, Simon, you're my rock. Okay, he has a rock. Chief cornerstone, nice little, you know, that's a rock. In Greek, it's Petros, meaning rock of Gilead. Okay. So it's a big rock. And he says, look, the gates of hell. So let me ask you all something. Are gates defensive or offensive weapons? Defensive. Okay. So do gates attack or keep you from something? Uh-huh. And then what opens a gate? Okay. So he said, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Okay, so, no. Hell won't prevail. Why? Because I'm giving you a key to unlock it to get into the kingdom. Because he says I give you the keys to the kingdom, but there's something blocking it, and it's called the gates of hell. So, he said, listen, I'm giving you keys. And these keys 
I'm going to open up what Satan's trying to block. And then you'll have power to bind what heaven binds. So what does heaven bind? Okay, let's just think, if we think kingdom, is there sickness in the kingdom? No. Is there lack in the kingdom? Is there death in the kingdom? So all the bad stuff is outside the kingdom. Okay? So whatever is bound and does not walk around freely in the kingdom, we can bind here on earth, right? Because he said, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, right? So my thinking, which isn't stinking right now, says that heaven binds the wicked stuff. So if I can get access to heaven and be a conduit like Jesus was, then what heaven binds, I can bind. And what's loosed in heaven, I can loose here on earth. Now, with that in mind, go to... Now, let me quickly just show you something that... Um, the word bound in Greek is the word dio. Okay? Dio. That's an O. I don't know why I made it an A. Okay? Dio means to bind, to be embodied, to incarcerate. Okay, and it's G1210 for those of you who like to go to your strongs. Now, if you look, I think it's Luke 13. Let's quit, let me quickly turn there. You turn there too. I'm more or less sure it's there. Okay, and it starts at about verse 15. Well, let's, let's start verse 13. I don't know where to start. Start at verse 10, I guess. Okay, and he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years, which was bowed um, together and could not in no wise lift herself up. And when Jesus saw her, he said, uh, when Jesus saw her, he called her unto him and said, Woman, thou art loose from thy infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. The ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation. That means he was mad. Indignation. That's such a fancy word. No? Must be British people that wrote that. Because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day. And he said to the people, There are six days in which men ought to work in them. Uh, therefore come and be healed not on the Sabbath day. And the Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, does not each of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his donkey? I'm not going to say that word. It's King James translation. Uh, from the stall and lead him away to watering. And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has bound. Okay? There's that word dia again. So whatsoever you bind, dear, and whatsoever, and this woman was bound, the same word, dear, that G1210. So we can bind, but Satan can also bind. Now listen what Jesus said. Uh, this daughter of Abraham, who Satan has bound, lo, these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath. And when he said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. So Jesus came and unbound a woman that was bound by Satan. You understand? So he bound the thing that bound her and loosed healing to her. So yeah, here's the thing. Satan has designed schemes and snares and traps in your life and warfare tactics to try and constrict the move of faith, the move of trust, and the move of hope of God in you. Right? But when you reach out to the Lord, when you go in and you say, enough's enough. See, I don't even think this woman was looking for a healing. He saw her. And was moved, like Jesus always was, was moved with compassion. You're a daughter of Abraham by your faith. You're, you are saved by His grace. The same compassion that He had on that daughter of Abraham, He has on you. And He saw her and He said, come. 
be loose. That's the heart of God. So the next warfare tactic is not to just trust His Word, but to trust His nature. Because He sees and he sees that there are things binding up your life. And he wants to bind those things and lose freedom to you. For whom the Son sets free is what? Free indeed, right? So if that daughter of Abraham pre-cross could get loosed, how much can you, when the price is fully paid, post-cross get? But you see, there's one difference. He gave us the power to do it. He gave us the keys. And he says, now you bind. And now you loose. Okay? There's an English saying, I don't know if it's South African or American, but it says, the ball's now in your court. You all get that saying? CO2? Okay, good. He put the ball in our court. I don't know, you know. It's, it's not a saying I use often. I'm not a sports analogy person. <laughs> he, he got me. He got me. Uh, you know, when, when I see them playing football and that, and I, like, and I see them running, I'm like, that's so unbiblical. The Bible says, only a fool run when no man pursues, but I guess there are people pursuing them because he's got a ball. Just drop the ball, dude. No one will chase you. Drop the ball. You know? And then they run so far, and then they drop the ball. I'm like, dude, you could have dropped it earlier off, and you wouldn't have had to run, run that much, ran that much. Oof. Past tense. Oof. Thank you for those courtesy laughs. Uh, so, <laughs> but you understand, sometimes we, we, we have the word, but we should also add the nature of God to it. Because if you know, uh, it's easier for me as uh, after becoming a father for over a year now. Um, I love that kid so much. And I understand the scripture that there's nothing I wouldn't do for her. Me being evil knows how to do good things and how much more. So I, I'm starting to dive on that how much more would God do for me. You know, how much more? Now, I know Ephesians 3.20, he does exceedingly abundantly far above all we can think, ask, or even imagine. And I've got a very vivid imagination, so I'm like, God, <laughs> can you compete? I know you can, but sometimes my imagination's right out there, and he's like, it's too small. really big. It's, it's too small. If it doesn't scare you, it's not me. I want to do exceedingly. Now, my warfare is starting to change. Yeah, you have your good days and your bad days. But on the larger scales of things, how I'm thinking, I'm shifting. Okay, I wanted to start with this, but now let's start with that. And then God says, yeah, but that's still Ishmael. Go a little bit larger. I'm like, a little bit larger? Uh, Jesus, do you know what that would be monthly? That would cost? It's like, last time I checked, I wasn't broke. I'm like, okay. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, you explain it to the wife and then we'll talk again. And he's like, I gotcha. Next morning we wake up and the wife looks at me and she's like, hey, I was thinking we should go a little bit. I'm like, just, we're doing it. Let's do it. Go. Like, when did you start thinking this? Because I, 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 I tend to now write times. Because I, I, I got that, that revelation when the centurion inquired what time was the servant healed about this time. That he spoke to Jesus. So I'm like, about what time did you start thinking this? Oh, about 3 p.m. yesterday. I'm like, we're doing it. It's fine, it's fine. No explanation needed. We're doing it. Because I'm starting to trust the nature of this good father. So my warfare isn't strenuous because I've learned that if Scripture says the blessing of the Lord makes rich and adds no sorrow to it, God did not design, now sure, in this world we'll have many troubles, but fear not, for I've overcome the world. Even Paul likened all his great afflictions as momentary and light afflictions. But this dude's getting beat for the gospel. I, you know, I don't know. I don't think there's many of us that today have the constitution 
to take that for the gospel until we really fall in love with Jesus. You know? We'll, we'll see when we start the tent meetings who's got the constitutions <laughs> for, for that when we take comfort completely out the 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 picture, you know? Do you really love me, Peter? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I love you, but pour down fire from heaven. I was made for comfort. Camping is like the Marriott Inn for me. I'm a Hilton person. The Ritz Carlton. I want them fancy runny eggs with crab. I don't know what you call it. <laughs> eggs Benedict. You know? But how do you change your warfare without changing how you think? See, Satan, as a man thinketh so is he. If you think you're defeated, you're defeated. But if you think you're victorious, you will be victorious. You see, all these things that come against you only have grit when you allow them to take hold of you. When you, you know, if you think of it, those of us who've done bench press, if I go into that set, now, yeah, look, life does get you sometimes. Let's, let's not beat around the bush and try and be more spiritual than what we really are. Life gets you. And there's sometimes where we just don't want to fight. And it's, and it's not because we're unspiritual. It's just because we're tired. But the Bible says, be not weary in well-doing. It says, don't allow tiredness to affect you. Because in due season, you will reap if you don't faint, if you don't give up, if you don't lose heart. Sometimes you're just going to be tired. Sometimes you're going to have things on all fronts. And it's going to make you tired. But you have to train your spiritual man. Train your godly senses to stay alert, to stay focused on what God has implanted in you, on the incorruptible thoughts that need to take manifest in your life, in your mind. And keep resisting. So it's, again, if you've done a lot of weightlifting and after the third or fourth rep, your arms start feeling a little shaky, you feel a little nauseous because, you know, the, anyone done gym here? You, you know, you, you feel a little nauseous. The arms are shaking. You you feel a little lightheaded, maybe. You know, you're drinking water and it's just making you more nauseous because now you've worked these muscles out. They're producing chemicals and stuff and lactic acid and all this stuff is just. But you go again and you go and push them. And you push those weights. And you, now you, you know that you don't have the strength that you had when you started. But you go and you finish. And you strain through those last reps. That's where the most effective is. That's when the muscles build. That's when the fibers are stretched so far that they need, they grab all the proteins and the minerals. And again, and they build themselves bigger and stronger. And the next time you go and do those reps and that you've got the power that you had before. Why? Because your body, your spiritual man, has a new constitution of faith, a fortified. That's why we go from what? Faith to faith. So the straining that I went through this last warfare by resisting those thoughts, you know, that spiritual mind, which is your spiritual biceps and pectorals and quads and whatever, abs, you know, they've been trained. They've been... Um, worked out to take a different type of resistance but this time you now if you stay at that weight what happens you just throw it around like that it doesn't do much after a while huh you just 300 pounds and you're like yeah 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 you know now go put 50 on that side and 50 on that and it's like yeah you know, a little oof and a little ah. You know, after rep number 30, it's like ooh ah. You start praying in tongues. Right? Because there's a new strain, because you can take more. But we go from glory to. Now, I'm not saying there's a devil for every level, but I'm telling you, as you renew your mind, the things that seem more impossible 
start coming into play. When I started healing the sick, the wheelchair was the ultimate. You know, if you got someone out of a wheelchair, you, you're a great faith healer. You know, and it's amazing to me that there were not so many blind people. And by that I don't mean spiritually, I mean physically. In most of my meetings. But all of a sudden, for a season, blind people just started coming. You know, and then you're like, oh, I know the blind see. But now it's on me. What do I do now, Jesus? It's like, what do you do with the wheelchair? I said, well, I grab their legs, I shake them, like I saw Brother Alan do, and Brother Oral, and Quibus, and all those, you know, who I modeled their, my faith after. I said, I speak, and I command, and I pick them up. He's like, so why not? What did, what did I do? I said, well, there's one time you went... <laughs> And you spat in the ground. I said, but you know, this is Africa. We got grass, not sand. So, but you did say ifata, which is an Aramaic word for open. But that was for ears, not for eyes. He's like, well, I'm a good e ENT. He says, it all works the same. One, one pill fits all. So he said, why don't you just go put your thumbs over their eyes and say ifata. Ifata. Can you see? Ifata. Jesus, we got a problem. Your pill's not working. He said, and in a moment he spoke to my heart so clear, and I remember it. He said, son, it's not my methodology that's working. It's because you think you're in this alone. Why don't you ask me to follow you? And for the first time in ministry in my life, I felt him stand like a, you know, you know when someone's standing behind you, right? I felt someone stand next to me. And I, as I said, if I, I could hear him say it with me. And I mean, these people just started shaking and falling out in the power. And as they got up, their eyes would see, their eyes would see, their eyes would see. The warfare changed, because, not because the devil got weaker, but because my trust in his nature got reinforced because he took the time to walk with me. He, when he says he's a good father, he means it. When he says he's the good, the friend that sticketh closer than a brother, he means it, and his nature doesn't change. My warfare changed, not because the devil got weaker and I got stronger. It's because I got closer. See, Satan is cast out. The accuser that accused the brethren day and night is cast down. I just have to be where he is. I must be the one seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. My circumstances only change when he gets in the picture, not when the devil gets out. You see, because when the light comes, darkness cannot comprehend it. Light and darkness don't mix. The darkness has to flee when the Lord's near. So it's not the absence of a spiritual warfare or a fight. It's the absence of me bringing His light into my current search, circumstance and situation that makes warfare effectual. Colossians 2.10. Turn there with me. I'll start at verse 6. As you have received therefore Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith. You have been taught, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man should spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and the rudiments of this world, and not after Christ, for in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, 
which is the head of all principality and power. You are complete in Him who is the head of all. Every principality, every power that you'll ever face, if you are in Him, you're complete. And you have full range and full rulership over every principality as long as you are in Him who is the head. That's why God, all God's promises are yes and amen in Him. No demon, no principality. Romans 8, 31, 32, 33, 34 says, What shall separate us from the love of God? Neither life, death, things present, things to come, angel, principality, power, ruler, dominion. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And when we in Him, who is the head of all, all things are subject to us. So it's not about binding a water spirit, about binding this spirit, going to the courts of heaven and doing this and doing that. It's being in Him who is the head of all things. And through Him and by Him and in Him we live, move and have our being. And in Him we have power and dominion over everything, circumstance, situation, things that want to war, things that want to fight. I think of it this way. My sister can come to me anytime because I'm her big brother. And if someone wants to fight her and she comes to me, she doesn't got to fight. I'll fight for her. It's the same thing with him. If anyone wants to touch my wife, they got to go through me. I don't care who it is. If they're six foot seven, you know what? I got a Smith and Wesson that's coming by faith. And I will pop them full of lead and they will not get her. How much more Him? Because why? We're in Him. If you're with me, you're good. You're not with me. Well, <laughs> you're shark food. You understand? So, we're victorious by association. We're victors by marriage. We're victors by family. Because He is the brother. He is the bridegroom. He is the head of this body. I'm not going to let someone hit my body just because they don't hit my head. I'm not going to let them hit my gut and my shoulders. And No. I love my body. I might not look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but you know, I'm okay with the dad bod. Worked hard on it. Spent a lot of Twinkies getting it like this. Okay? So too, he's the head of this body, and he will not let anyone hurt his body. So do you understand? You are victorious and saved. Soterius, sozo, you are saved from all things to come. But God does want you to manifest. So if Satan can bind, now, let me, let me explain something about hierarchy. It, it's simple. But I think it's so simple, we miss it because we're looking for a deep explanation. So, this is Jesus, forgive me that I can't draw well. He's King of kings and Lord of lords with a crown with many crowns on, okay? Yes, the devil. I'm going to try and draw him as small as I can. Okay, see, that's him. He's really tiny. Okay. He rules here. Jesus rules above all. So, let's do a Lion King moment. Everything the light touches, Simba. Okay? <laughs> okay? So, everywhere where Jesus is, and he, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein. So, all things were made by Him, and without Him was nothing made. So, we can agree that He got the whole world in His hands, right? Now, you see, there's a shadowy place called sin. We don't go there, Simba. It's an elephant graveyard, Simba. Don't go there. So, everything can hide in the shadows. But, if I'm not in the shadows, if I associate with light and I stand there with Him, I rule over there. But if I fall under the condemnation of sin and I lose sight of my identity and my rights to be with Him by the redemption of the blood, I put myself under subjection of that, even though it's not my portion. The whole thing about the prodigal son is this.
the Bible says when he came unto himself he said even the servants in my father's house eat better than this but he had to come himself he had to realize his identity and the nature of the father so he came back not fully understanding the father's love but he trusted enough to that the father would take him and make him a servant but what did he get more than what he bargained for he came back and the father welcomed him the father took him in the father loved him but all he had to do is get back his identity get back his truth which is the shield and the buckler of our lives and then everything he was subject to before what happened did he have to keep going back there and say you shall never have me again you shall never have me again pig farmer shrine Baba you will never have me again I have to self away no he just had to what simple abide but in the father's house did he have to go to the pigsty and say you sh I shall never return here again I bind you seven spirits of pigs you shall never I shall never eat of your food again you don't have me I have been delivered set free or did he just have to stay with the father I think when we grasp the nature of salvation we'll find that spiritual warfare is just really getting your thoughts in order it's not about what spirit rules where and what principality rules where you know um, Charles Finney would go into a city and he would pray outside the city for the revival meetings and then when we, could, we would come in people were already in the streets repenting crying and saying Finney must be in town because he had such a reputation that he would he didn't take authority he just said father I'm here and I'm here so you are here and because you are here the light of God and the salvation of man is near and he would shout at the top of his lungs repent for the kingdom of God is here and as he would shout that people sometimes would hear it sometimes they wouldn't but the echo of the light of his words would hit through the town and people would start repenting and just start weeping in the streets and he would come in and just and this was back in the days when they still had horses and he trot into town on a horse think of it when the apostles people would lay them the sick in the street and they would just trust for the shadow of the of Peter to come by the wayside so they could get healed that doesn't sound like spiritual warfare that sounds like giving the devil a spanking I never read where they had to bind water demons and anything like that it says whatsoever you bind shall be bound from heaven whatsoever you loose is loose from heaven so sometimes I think we just need to take charge of mindsets and bind up our mindsets towards a thing and think God's thoughts and speak them out and loose into the atmosphere the heart of God over that situation. You know? Just speak the mind of Christ over those things. He said, I behold I give you power to tread on serpents scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing by any means shall hurt you now yes yes my thinking on that if you tread on serpents and scorpions I've never seen a snake face you as an equal they don't really get much higher than the knee either so your warfare is much lower than what you think all you have to do is step on it but you know what what is the warfare representation for the gospel of have your feet shed with the gospel of peace so the moment I have rest and peace 
as trample on serpents and devils. What did he say when you come and preach the gospel and you enter into a house and they accept you? What did he say? Put your peace there. If they don't accept you, take your what? Peace back. So what are you doing? You're taking the ability to take the gospel of peace. It said the gospel of peace. So you take the gospel and the peace that it brings. Peace from what? The onslaught of the enemy. What does the gospel teach? The good news. What is the two words? Sozo and salteria, meaning total deliverance from the kingdom of darkness, right? So he says, take that message of peace and put it on that house. And they can be delivered from the enemy. If they don't accept it, take it back and take it to whom will. If you believe, you are free. The condition was always believing. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you shall be what? Saved. Saved from what? Everything. Because we are translated from the kingdom of darkness into his what? Marvelous light. So that peace that must come and that ruling and abiding peace that comes. You know, when um, Judah was given the prophecy by Israel, he said, the scepter shall not pass from your hand until Shiloh comes. That word Shiloh is the first and the oldest Hebrew word for total peace. It actually means great river of peace until Shiloh comes. The scepter will not depart from Judah. The ruling power. And if you see in Revelations, it said he had a what? A scepter. Knock, knock. Who's there? All right. So, we rule by peace. We rule in the midst of our enemies. What does God prepare in the presence of our enemies? A table. Yeah. What do you do with a table? Chow down. You feast in a war in the kingdom because the victory is already won. The Lamb has overcome. If you look at 1 Corinthians 15 and 2 Corinthians 2, it says it this way. It says, But thanks be to God who always gives us, who always leads us into triumph. Let me read it so I don't misquote it. But it says, But thanks be to God, 1 um, Corinthians 15, 57 says, But thanks be to God which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Then he says this in 2 Corinthians 2. He says that thanks be to God who always causes us to what? Triumph. Uh, 2 Corinthians 14, chapter 2, verse 14 says, Now thanks be unto God which always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus, making manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. You always have the victory. You always triumph. Why? Because you're rooted and grounded in Christ. So it's not really a warfare. It's more like a fixed game. You've already got the victory. Right? So, understanding hierarchy, if I'm in Him, who is the head of all principalities, you need to understand this. Now, Justin over there, he, he's a Navy guy. He works out, right? So, between the two of us, if he's the stronger one and we go into a war, a fight, an altercation, obviously he's the head, right? He's stronger, he's faster, he's better, he's trained for war. A soldier goes in against a novice, a, a weakling, you know, someone who doesn't train at all, who eats bonbons and tinkies, right? I go into a fight with him, he's, the, he's obviously, the, you know? So, it's not much of a match at all, right? So, hierarchy tells me that he would win. Well, same with Christ Jesus. He's won. I'm in him, so the victory is his. And I'm an heir of salvation, which means total deliverance. So, if we heirs of salvation through him, then by default, I'm a victor. So hierarchy tells me that because I'm in Him, what I bind, being 
him being the head of all principalities and powers, has higher power over what the enemy bounds, right? So, if Satan's bound something, and I come, and I bind what he binds, who's got the higher power? Me or the devil? Me. So, why then do we not bind up what the devil's bound and loose on earth what God has loosed from heaven? It said Jesus went around undoing all the works of the devil, healing all that were afflicted by the enemy. He went and he undid the works of darkness. So Satan's got... So, where's my goodies? Okay. So this is the principality of darkness, right? And now, uh, give me your hand. So now, Satan comes, I'm the devil, and now he binds her. Yay! This is fun, right? You bound. Seriously, I'm trying to make a point. So Jesus comes, <laughs> Jesus comes, and he unbinds. He looses to her healing. He Okay, thank you. She, now she, she's bound. Pretend. Just. For, <laughs> then Jesus comes. Oh, and he unbinds. He looses. So he says, is it not better for, is it, is it really unlawful for a daughter of Abraham who's bound by Satan to not be loosed by the son of righteousness? Right? So why don't we go about loosing that which the devil's bound and start binding the wicked stuff that is loosed on the earth. Because if we're in Him, who is the head of all principalities and powers, the Word says we have the power. I think we just don't believe that, and that's why the world's in a mess. And we're, we're, we're untrained spiritually to have that stamina to resist all the tempting thoughts of the enemy. But what if we would to just come to this place where we decided you know what, I want to be spiritually fit. I want to resist. I want to bench press 300 pounds of evil thoughts away from myself. I want to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger in the spirit. Hmm? And have the power to resist those thoughts. And then have the power of God to loose people from the hands of the enemy. And even my own circumstances. Right? I just think it's time that we start binding that wicked stuff that the enemy has loosed in our lives. Those things that he lets run rampant, those thoughts. And start getting a hold of God's thoughts and loosing them in our lives. Wouldn't it be great if we had the attitude of what's the best that could happen? Where's Miss Marie now? I'm throwing. Yeah, yeah. You know? What's the best that can happen? What's God's thoughts on that? What if that's my starting point? And I run with that. I mean, this has given me a whole new perspective on warfare and people that I've shared it with, you know, and some people have got some real crazy stuff going on in their lives. But their testimony is this, and I don't want to share it because I don't really have their permission. But when I started sharing this with them and they started changing the way they think about the situation, the situation itself just started changing. You know, it's not to think it positive. It, that, that New Age stuff doesn't really work. But when I think God's thoughts into it, not thinking positive, when I think God's thoughts into it, that's when it changes. And it might not change the situation so much as what it changes you towards the situation. And the situation becomes way more bearable, not because it's changing, but because you've changed to only see God's thought about it and there it doesn't plague your soul it doesn't plague your mind it doesn't take your peace we're seeking his perspective and speaking his perspective into it see faith without works is still dead I've got to speak God's thoughts into it and I've got to really actually believe what I'm speaking you know I can't just speak empty faith that, that doesn't work I, as a man believes in his heart and then speaks with his mouth. That's when salvation comes. 
if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. You have to believe. It has to be settled in the heart. And then spoken with the mouth. And then it changes that in the natural. But the first person that's going to change is you. Because your heart's going to change towards it. And then the love of God is going to be manifest through your mouth and call those things that are not as though they are. Okay. Right. I think that's good. Now we're going to get to the practical part. And our friends on YouTube, they can catch that later.